The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Because what that map represents is our new series, Lighthouse, where we are declaring that we have people from all over the city in the city area in this community, and we want to make sure that we remind ourselves that we're not just called to gather on Sundays as a church, but to be the church all week long by declaring each of our homes as a lighthouse in our neighborhood. That piece of paper on your chair it, that is the kind of a, has a lighthouse banner on top gives you some specific directions for what to do if you and when you put that tack on that map because we don't just want like, hey, it was cool, I tacked my address in church and then I went home. We want you to tack that as a beginning to a journey that you start to look at your home address in a completely new way. That you didn't, believe it or not, you maybe just bought because of the property value or because you loved the bones of the house or you really liked the neighborhood or you lived this close to Target or um, Dress Barn. I just love the name of that store, Dress Barn. I don't know, it just seems weird. Anyway, so you might have, have your reasons for living where you live, but God also has his reasons and he wants you to be there with purpose. And so this series aims to help each of us honor the commandment that Jesus gave us when he said, okay, they said, Jesus, what's the most important thing we can do? Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Second, love your neighbors. Now, that's the people you live and work and go to school with. It's the people you actually share a residence with. And instead of trying to just send money into a different part of the world, which we do every Sunday, instead of just trying to be a good person, you know, at a, in a service project across town, we start with the people we live closest to, or we're simply people trying to cover up for that kind of emptiness in our lives. So this is a great place to start. If you want to really shore up your relationships and your closest sphere of influence in your home and your neighborhood, this series is just a fantastic way to do that. So there's a great video you can be able to watch on the webpage that's mentioned there telling you how to shine, uh, set the stage and then how to shine a light in your neighborhood. We've begun to take prayer walks in our neighborhoods, and if we have time today, we're gonna to show you a little video of when I took a prayer walk during the blizzard this last week in, in my neighborhood, and, and just help you understand how that's done. And, and, and the, the whole thing is, there are so many really good things happening through this church. I'm so proud. Last week, we brought 75 tags to church, representing 75 kids who will not receive Christmas presents if someone doesn't say, you know what, I'm not just gonna do my Christmas, I'm gonna share that, and maybe even sacrifice something to give someone else a Christmas gift. And so last week, we, we, we couldn't even get through church before all those gifts were gone. I got halfway through and somebody held up the empty totes and 75 gifts had been just given out just like that. And for me as a pastor, that's just like, yes. It means that these people are getting it. That we don't just get together and talk about a generous God without ourselves absorbing that generosity and sharing it. Because following God means to live like him. Following God means to let him live through you. And when I, when I do things like that, there's always a side of me that says, Ugh, if I give this opportunity and nobody does it, what's that going to say about our church and the work we're doing? And continually, consistently, this church steps up and just gives or serves. You know, that table over there, there's all these new sign-up sheets. And I truly believe that after church, that thing's going to be full because you guys are, this is a serving community. You're not just going to show up next Sunday and throughout Christmas. You're going to help out. And so I just I want to thank you in advance for being an open-handed community, for being a generous community. Uh, every Sunday, we check in on char for charity on Facebook. And, and we had like two check-ins feed a, a child around the world. That was our cause last month. This month, it's the Book of Hope, as you saw in the video. And you guys just take the time, get your phone out, go through the button pushing. Some of us, that's like climbing Mount Everest because we're not techie. And, and we've just fed 168 kids just by pushing a few buttons on our smartphones. This month, almost a dozen organizations in our city are getting a mercy box. And that's because members of our community band or our church band together and, and on, our, on our mercy box team and are strategically looking for ways to re recruit new partners look for new businesses and nonprofits and schools that want to partner with us and host a mercy box. Um, it's just a really, really cool thing that we're proud of as a church. These good things are happening all the time. We have people in this community. It's not even all centrally planned events. We do things like this, centrally planned events, simply to create a culture in which you guys do this all the time. We are not a, an events-centered church. We are not a program church. So when people come here, they're like, hey, what do you have for this group and that group? I'm like, eh, I don't really know. We just do stuff to try to turn you loose and send you to the city to make a difference. We don't, 
we don't try to get you to come to a million things because we're not a program church. We're not a buffet line where you have to load up a plate of programs and consume religious goods and services. We equip you to do ministry out there. That's our vision as Surprise Church, to be the surprise of God to a world in need by building a family of servant missionaries, and that's who we are. But today we're going to ask the question, how do we actually do that on a regular, routine basis? How do we do that in such a way that it doesn't happen or not happen based on just kind of coincidence? How, you know, if you live and work next to someone that really needs God's presence to be shown through you, how do you make sure that it happens rather than just say, well, I started being a Christian at age seven and I'm sure things will work out. You know, some people, that's how many people become Christians. Their parents grow up to them and go, hey, um, you know, would you like to go to hell and burn forever? Or maybe come to heaven with mom and I? Uh, you know, seven-year-old's eating his post-toast. He's like, oh, heaven? Great. Let's say a prayer. You're Christian. And there's never been much depth beneath that, you know? It's like, sure. And in those circumstances, what I worry about is that we never actually grab a hold of the goodness that God has for us in Jesus and then say, I'm going to share this. I'm going to live this out. So we're asking the question today, how does light become a lifestyle? How do we make sure that it's not just not just like a, a cultural badge we wear on our sleeves when it's appropriate and then we cover up when it's inconvenient, but the people that I'm surrounded with are going to see Jesus through me. I am not going to trip and stumble my way through life in darkness because I have a lifestyle of light. I have a lifestyle of, of Jesus-centered living. How do you make sure that happens rather than, eh, we'll see what happens? Now, I'd love to tell you that it would just happen if you smile more. You know, the studies have been released that say if you smile more, chemicals get shot into your brain that make you feel a little bit better, right? Try it, ready? Um, pay attention to how you feel. Now we'll all smile on three. This would be a good picture. Like, everybody really likes me here. <laughs> One, two, three, smile. Don't you feel better? Not that much. I mean, it, it helps a little bit. But like if, if you hit your finger with a hammer, you can smile all you want. That sucker's going to hurt. <laughs> right? Some people might think it happens if you eat more chocolate. How many of you believe that? If you just eat more chocolate. And again, studies have shown that if you have chocolate, and I personally like the dark, dark, dark chocolate. Anybody with me on that? Jesus made dark chocolate on the eighth day. 86% um, dark. That's what I do. That's how I roll. 86% dark. The darker, the better. Who needs sugar? Not me. And studies have shown that that stuff actually produces a chemical. I think it's endorphins. I'm not a medical doctor type guy, but I think it's endorphins uh, that go into your brain when you have that. So that creates a good feeling, right? Well, Dave, you slipped on the ice. You, separ you separated your shoulder, dislocated it. Do you think dark chocolate would have made it feel better? Absolutely. Okay. That helps. That really helps the sermon move along. Thank you. Thank you for that help. Remind me not to call on you next time. Some things dark chocolate cannot help. Some things they can, evidently, more than I thought. Sometimes you, you, you can't just kind of do like a Band-Aid fix for a real challenge like um, light and darkness in life. Sometimes you have, actually have to turn to uh, the things that otherwise will own you and deal with them. So my answer, as you're tracking along in your bulletin insert for, for the answer, how does light become a lifestyle? How do you become a regular, routine follower of Jesus in the everyday stuff of life, all of life following Christ, rather than this little bit here every other week on Sunday morning? How does that become a lifestyle? And, and my answer is when we deal with our darkness. When you and I are not afraid to turn into the mirror, put other people who can help us see the blind spot, spot the dark spot, the broken piece, the broken part, the gap, when you and I aren't afraid to look at someone and say, what do you see? When we're not afraid to look at that thing and call it what it is, that's how you live a lifestyle of light. And if you don't, you live a lifestyle of darkness. Now, I'm preaching to you today, but I'm preaching to me because there is nobody that this issue reminds me more of myself because I, I don't see all of your issues. I see all of mine. I have to live with myself on a daily basis. I'm well aware 
I'm not completely aware because God is nice enough not to show me all my issues. He only shows me what I can handle. <laughs> but I'm well aware that I need to hear this because if I don't routinely surround myself with people who can speak into my pain and brokenness and, and issues, then I'm going to succumb to them. And I believe that that's true for pastors. It's true for everybody. So uh, I'm gonna, today we're going to look at Ephesians 4. And Ephesians 4 gives us uh, a, a, nice, a nice picture and a reset button. It, it, it kind of analyzes the human soul for what it is and the broken patterns of thinking that we have at living in a fallen world, and then it points us in the right direction. And I'm hoping that you hear this and take it into yourself. Don't hear it as something that your spouse just needs to hear, you know. Don't just be praying that the guy or gal next to you gets this or you're going to suggest that they go online when you get home and you give it to someone else. This is for you today, okay? This is for you. I want you to soak this in, Okay. Ephesians 4, listen to, to how he's writing. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus on the western side of Turkey, present day. Strategic kind of a uh, you know, location that kind of was a crossways for people heading to, to, to Italy. And he's talking to them about their ten- tendency to slip back into broken patterns that when they first met Christ, they walked away from because Jesus was so much better and now they're slipping back into it. So he's writing this letter to kind of call them back to the truth, okay? So this is him kind of intervening in their lives. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. You can't just say, I'm a Jesus guy, and then go on with life as usual. He's not just a badge. He is a transformative, complete life change. He is, he is like going from the rotary phone to a smartphone. Everything changes doesn't it? Like, at one point in my life, I said, I'm never going to get a smartphone. I just don't need one. I'm fine having a cord to the wall every time I'm talking. I'm fine with that. And now I don't know what I would do without it, right? Jesus is that thing that you don't know how to do life without him when you have him. And yet, he's also something that you can walk away from. You must no longer do that, or you must no longer live the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. What comes to mind for you when you hear the word futility? Last service had a few good adjectives. What, what do you think of when you think of futile? Throw it out there. I got a hat on it, so I can't hear very well. Louder. And now you all said at the same time, I can't hear. <laughs> Impossible. Hopeless, pointless, useless. Good. Exactly. You must stop living as they live in the uselessness, pointlessness, hopelessness of their thinking. And here's, now listen to him describe their thinking. They are darkened, darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Here's why. Because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Sometimes we participate in a, in a certain lifestyle or, or relationship because we think it'll enlighten us and it give us a broader sense of experience and joy, and it actually darkens us and it separates us from the life God wants for us. Adam and Eve took the fruit because they thought it would make them aware of good and evil and more aware and, and more experienced in life, and it actually closed down their sensitivities and it shut down their lives and it led to more brokenness. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity. This is so ironic. Watch what happens. When, when I turn away from God and I, I start to lose my sensitivity so that God just doesn't seem that precious anymore and the gospel of Jesus doesn't seem that important anymore and the, the boundaries that God gives me for living and defining myself don't seem that helpful. They seem more threatening. When I walk away from that and when I shut out people who can remind me of that, I start getting insensitive. It says, having lost all sensitivity, hardening of the heart, the word there is calloused. So put your finger on your calluses. Feel these babies. And by the way, you can only feel them with the finger touching them. You can't really feel on the callus, can you? Don't be afraid. You can touch yourself. (laughs) Did I just say that? Yeah. Touch your callus. Touch your callus. It's numb because it's layers of dead skin. Your body naturally does that to protect itself in areas that are frequently used and touched and rubbed and gripping. It's great for your knuckles. It's 
deadly for your heart. Hardening of the heart, both medically and spiritually, is a deadly condition. Having lost all sensitivity, now watch what we do. This is you and me, not the naughty person that you have in the back of your mind. This is you and me. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality. So as to indulge in every kind of impurity and are full of greed. Wow, look at that ironic contrast. I can't feel anymore. I have turned away from God, engaged in a lifestyle that is broken, in patterns that are fruitless, product, improductive, and futile. And that numbness makes me desperate to feel again, and so I am going to do things trying to feel anything. When you stop feeling, you start trying to satisfy every urge you have because it makes, at least short term, it makes you feel again. And you want to feel something. You don't want to feel alone. You don't want to feel sad. You don't want to feel so hurt. You don't want to feel so stressed out. And so you turn to something that makes you feel something else. When you're numb, you turn to sensuality it says, whatever that means, addiction, chemicals, gossip, sex, whatever, porn, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So I took this passage, and I, love, I like boiling it down and outlining it. It's really helpful to do. You don't have to be a, a scholar to do it. Take a passage of Scripture, and if there's a lot there, just start making a little bit of an outline or a bullet point list of what pops out at you. And here's what you get here. Useless thinking. It describes the reality of darkness is where my heart is calloused. My ability to receive love and compassion from God and, their, and, 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 and let the needs of others in and then share compassion to them is broken because I have turned away from God and so I am calloused. I am not able to empathize with people when I don't accept God's empathy for me. When I don't routinely put myself in environments where I recognize that the Father's heart is good and gracious I turn away, separate myself with that life, and I am a callous person. Other people's needs are barriers to me rather than opportunities to share what I have received from God. I'm darkened in my understanding. I am ignorant. I am separated from God's life, and I have no sensitivity to the needs and pain of others because I have not turned to a God who would otherwise be sensitive to mine. The response to that reality of darkness is sensual indulgence. I, I need to feel again. I have made a decision to turn away from uh, the kind of feeling that comes with the patient, slow, treading water in the gospel. And so I'm going to turn to the short, quick fixes that promise me immediate gratification but ultimately leave me feeling worse. And the result of that, indulging every urge I have, I do get full, but I don't get full of what I want to get full of. I just get full, it says, of greed. So if you meet a person who is totally turned to a lifestyle of satisfying their every want, urge, and need, they are a person who they, they barely can look at you because they're so obsessed with themselves. We get like this when that's how we try to satisfy the hole in our hearts that only God can fill. And so we are full of greed. So here, let me summarize it another way. Darkness is separation from God numbs my heart and indulging my urges leaves me more selfish, more numb, more miserable. I am full of greed, but I'm empty. I am desperate to feel, but I'm numb. You know the other thing about this? Here's the, here's the worst thing about darkness. Nobody, nobody has permission to tell me. I will wall myself off from anyone who is going to call my thinking, living, or speaking into question. And what this is, is it's a sophisticated form of hiding because, of course, that doesn't mean that I have to hide in my basement to hide. It doesn't mean that I have to not go out in public to hide. It just means that I can sit in a row on Sunday and smile and make sure that when I leave the door, all of this stays behind me and nobody says, okay, let's figure out how to do that today and how's it going for you. I can sit in a row on Sunday and just cruise, and then you know what? I get to hide. 
I don't have to deal with the pain of someone saying, what are you doing? What you are doing is, is not good for you. It's not good for your family. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your faith. That's not who you are. I, as a parent, you have a lot of opportunities. What can I say in public about this? As, as a parent, you have a lot of opportunities to talk to your kids about how they're living and then try to point them into a healthier place without making them feel horrible about themselves, which is what your first impulse is, okay? So we were getting after our son yesterday for something that I don't feel comfortable mentioning in public. My wife did post up about it on Facebook, so I guess you could find it there. <laughs> and, and at first, we're just like, we're ready to just bring down the fire and just like badger him into shame and submission. And of course, that urge comes out as a parent because you want so much more for your kid. And, and yet I know that if we, if we talk to him as if he is the problem and not just a bad decision, then he's going to see himself more and more and more and more as just a dark being that's going to live that life. And so we want... I, when I, when I calmed down, I took back a few things I said and just said, you're a good, this is the best I could do at the time, you're a good boy, and you made a bad decision. Because I want him to know, I expect, just like God expects you and I to fail more than we expect ourselves to, I, I should expect my kids to fail and need to be reminded who they are and who they aren't, because all that behavior stuff flows out of identity. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. I tell him that every night as I talk to him in. And he is. But good people, good Christians make bad decisions. Do you have someone who can tell you that? This letter is being written to a group of people who need to hear it. So look what he says next. That lifestyle, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and you were taught in him according to the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. And he continues talking about what they were taught when they were called out of the darkness. Look at four times in three verses, he reminds them that someone spoke at one point into their darkness. Someone had access. Someone had permission to call them out of darkness, to put their finger on the sensitive issue that they needed to hear about, to, 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 to speak words of challenge, words of correction, words of conviction. That, that they, At that time, they were not walled off to the challenge of the gospel, but also the opportunity and healing and restoration of the gospel. And so they were able to go from darkness to light because someone had an access point and they weren't hiding. But now as he looks back, he sees him again. He said, wait a minute. You've gone into hiding. You're, you have separated yourself from the life of God. You, you've become ignorant, and, and you're making decisions that are more like the people that don't know Jesus. You're, you're, you've gone backwards. And so maybe he's the only person that they would listen to. And we know because he's writing them a letter. And in that letter, he is reminding them four times in two sentences that you were once spoken to in a way that brought light and healing and hope into your life, and I'm doing it again right now. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, the patterns of life that were broken, you gave someone permission to put their finger on it and say, enough, enough. This is not a shortcut to being happy. This is a stumbling stairway into darkness and it's gonna numb your heart and you're gonna only think that the way out of it is more of it and it's gonna kill you. It's going to make you the least empathetic, least sensitive, least caring and kind person you can be, and it's going to feel to you right. So look what he says. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I'll admit, sometimes I'll give clothes the smell test. Anybody do that with clothing? 
just me. Great. So I, I, I don't like washing clothes that much. And so, you know, if it's not visibly dirty or it doesn't make me choke when I smell it, sometimes I'll put it back in the drawer. Keep, sue me. I think that just makes me green, right? This shirt I had on yesterday, I smelled it this morning. It smells fantastic. I like the way I smell sometimes. So I put it on today. Okay. But there are times where the shirt's got to go. And if I don't admit it, someone else is going to tell me. Take that wrinkly, stinky, stained thing off. And to them, he's saying, if you don't mind me saying, that's got to go. You're wearing the, the outfit you used to wear before Jesus was your Lord, your leader, your forgiver. You're, you're wearing that same pattern that you said doesn't work for you not who you are, and you're clinging to it again. What? You got to take that off. You got to put that off, and you got to put on the new self. And now look how he describes the difference between what they're taking off and what they're putting on. The thing he asks them to take off again, because they've re-put it on, is a self that's, that's being led by deceitful desires. On the bottom, I, I write, darkness deceives feelings. Write that down. We live in an age where people are encouraged to monitor their feelings and whatever you're feeling, it's a sign that that's who you are and who you're supposed to be and where you're supposed to go with your life, both from sexual orientation to gender identity to um, behaviors, uh, chemicals, and, and pornography, whatever. If you feel it, if, if you feel that you are this kind of person led to this kind of thing, just gauge it, write it down. If you feel it, that's the cosmos communicating with you, right? Please listen to me. Your feelings will lie to you. I have had to sit with and cry with and pray for so many people whose feelings led them to addiction of one kind or another, whose feelings led them to an illicit relationship, whose feelings led them to part ways with the people God was calling them to love and serve, whose feelings allowed them to get lost in lesser priorities. I, your feelings will lie to you. They will say, this is who you are. They will say anything that limits you from doing this or expressing that is bad for you. Your feelings will lie. And if that's the case, then why would we ever let a bad slice of pizza or a bad week of sleep shape our lifestyle? Why would we ever let the insecurities and anxieties that can plague us as human beings shape our decisions? It's, it's really difficult to sort out a God-led urge from a human urge, and that's why we have to surround ourselves with passages like this and people like this who can say, eh, not a feeling you want to follow. No, that is not who you are. Are you kidding me? That is directly in contrast with who God says you are. I don't care how you feel. You could feel like a unicorn there is no horn coming out of your head. You're not a unicorn. Feelings will lie to you. And I believe one of the most important things we can learn as Christ followers is that feelings follow people who follow Jesus. Either you're following your feelings or you're following Jesus. You cannot follow both because many, many days you will not feel like following Jesus. You know what he did before he went to the cross? He begged his father to get out of it. He did not feel like dying for you and I. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And if God in the human body can be so challenged by his feelings, so can we. And if he can reject them because they're not who he is, then it's important that we do as well with his help and with the help of other people. Darkness will deceive your feelings. Your feelings are deceitful. They do, not, they do not belong in the driver's seat. Feelings follow. The fine wine of life is when you do the work of living in a way that you know God wants you to live, and you say, feelings, you can come along for the ride. You can come back if you want to. This is where God's calling me. You can come. You can give me warm and fuzzies, and you can give me goosebumps whenever you're ready, but I don't care if you come back. I'm going this way because this is who I am. This is who Christ calls me to be, and eventually the feelings follow, and you have these moments of joy 
and splendor in worship, uh, moments of, of just deep affection for your spouse and, or for your children. You have these rewarding intervals, but they don't, the absence or presence of them doesn't matter to you because you know this is who you are based on who God says you are and where he wants you to live. Feelings lie. Feelings lie. Which leads me to the question, who has permission to tell you that? I leave a blank in your bulletin because I just, I just want you to write down a name of somebody today. And if you're like most believers, I believe that most believers do not give someone permission to do this and they struggle because of it. I want to challenge you. Write down the name of the person who has full permission to see everything and say something about it. This person has to love Jesus and love you and be someone you can trust to, to, to carry the heavy stuff. Or do you tend to gravitate towards people who are just going to kind of give you the nod and the wink? And it's okay. I mean, God wants us to build relationships with people of all walks of life, but he wants us to be able to do that so we can build a bridge so they can find hope and healing in the life of Jesus too. But sometimes we just kind of gravitate towards the people who aren't going aren't to challenge us, aren't going to want to kind of get in our face, aren't going to want to kind of air their dirty laundry and see ours. We're going to have a superficial relationship where we have fun, and nobody challenges anybody. Nobody gets questioned. We just wink, wink, nod, nod. And it's a substitute for a relationship. Do you surround yourself with yes men? Or do you have someone who has actual permission to look into your brokenness and who you know is going to say something when they see it? Do you have anybody like that? And if you don't, write the person's name who you are going to ask after today. Give them a call up to church saying, could we get together for coffee once a week? Could we chat on the phone once a week? Because I, I got stuff that I just need somebody to be able to look at and call me out on. Would you, would you ask me how I'm doing with drinking this week? Ask me how much I've drank. Ask me. Ask me. You have my permission to ask me because I am struggling with, with addiction. Ask me if I've been um, accessing porn sites. Will you be the person that Triple X Church, it's a Christian ministry, will you be a person that I can put your email address and they will email you every time I access porn? Will you be that person who can speak into it for me? Because you know what? Sometimes if God is the only person that knows, I'm okay with that because nobody else does. And I need somebody in the flesh to see it and say something. Who's, who's it going to be for you? And I hope you have more than one. If your answer to this question is no one, here's the translation to that answer. My friends, quote-unquote, cheer me on as pride and shame blister my soul. That's what this passage says is going to happen. Pride and shame are going to blister my soul so that I just stop feeling, and then I turn to short-term quick fixes so I can feel something which only make me more prideful, more shameful, more blistered, less sensitive, and more dark. And I'm not going to say it's too late for you, but there comes a point where you can't even feel your pain anymore, and 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 putting your hand up and asking for help becomes something that doesn't even occur to you anymore. So if you still feel something related to conviction and guilt, that is the Holy Spirit being gracious to you, saying, okay, let's deal with that. Let's not numb it. Let's deal with it. Here's my list. Here's the people, not exhaustive list, some people that can speak into my life who I, I give permission to, to call me out and ask the hard questions and I try not to wall myself off from them. These people, and I have a blank for you to fill in for yourself, have permission to expose my darkness, and here's why. It's not just because I'm a glutton for punishment. This, ex this keeps my heart soft, soft enough to be challenged, but also if I can be challenged by the same people who are going to love me, walk me, accept me anyway, then I'm also going to experience healing, and then when I'm healed, I'm going to be healthy enough to look at other people and feel their actual pain and brokenness and not just be consumed with covering up my own so that I can be light to them. This is all about getting us back on track to be the people that God calls us to be, rather than sidetracked with brokenness. See, if I, if, I, if I don't hide, I can shine a light. If I allow someone to turn the light on inside of me and look around, then that just means that I am going to have light to share with other people. Here's how Jesus said it. Here's how he said it. You are the light of the world. Now, many of you might say, well, no, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. No, he also said, you are the light of the world. If you know me, you have light in you. But he also was speaking to people who have a tendency to hide that light. 
So he says, a city on a hill can't be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a lampstand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they might see your good deeds and, and glorify your Father who's in heaven. He doesn't just give you a light. He gives you the commandment to let it shine and not hide in the darkness. At Surprise, we have missional community, people who band together to do good in the community but also care for one another. Our single and solo parents group is doing amazing. Our addiction recovery group is getting up and running with a meeting tomorrow night. Talk to me or Ernie if you want to learn more about that group. We have a Anne and, and Mark and their um, engaged and newlywed married couples group is getting up and running. And these people are growing as disciples. They're learning how to care for one another and they're making a huge difference. Ernie's also gathering teens and teen families today. And so you can sign up on his list if you want to get in the loop on that. We're going to have not just a, a, a program where you drop off your middle or high schoolers and we'll just feed them spiritually and send them home. We're going to equip you as a whole family to do faith together in your neighborhood. And we're going to equip kids to band together and, and, and make a difference in the community together. It's going to be an amazing commu missional community of teens. We have DNA groups in all of those communities that will get together once a week, three to four people, and, and do the heavy lifting of, of looking into each other's souls and, and proclaiming the gospel into areas that we pushed it away because darkness is so attractive when we're broken. And we have serving teams. You can just sign up. Stop by the table, please, after church. Get on a serving team because amazing things happen. When you're just working and rubbing elbows with somebody, soon you start telling stories and learning about each other, and soon you're visiting them in the hospital because you just learned that they had surgery and you were the one person they thought to text or they're sharing a prayer need that they wouldn't share with anybody, but they trust you because they've been serving and hanging out with you. And you feel like, man, I helped to make this place go, but I'm also shining a light and they're shining a light into me. You cannot hear me. I know all of us want to be good people. Nobody can shine a light before others unless someone speaks into your darkness. There's no way around it. Don't look for a shortcut. You know what's going to happen in January if nobody takes this seriously? I'm going to get about six to ten calls from couples who are falling apart every January. The high hopes of the holidays are behind us, and now we're back where we started. They haven't gone away. No gift, no gathering, took away the pain, and now we're just into the doldrums of life. And they just didn't buy the fact that if I don't let people speak into my darkness, I'm going to stay there. It gets worse and worse and worse until they have no choice. I'm going to invite the band back up as I close with a story about Aaron. Aaron was a college student, and uh, he was connected to a Christian group for a time, but he did not necessarily uh, see himself as a leader or wasn't terribly active. And what happened with Aaron was he fell into a deep depression and stopped connecting with his friends, stopped attending ministry and church out gatherings, and just kind of withdrew to himself. He just he just was ashamed of how miserable he was. He was ashamed and didn't feel like he had the right to share his pain and, and just withdrew and literally spent every day in his dorm room, stopped eating, stopped drinking, and just withdrew and withdrew. Two of his friends were out for a prayer walk, which we challenge you to do. Uh, go to our, the website and just watch an example of the prayer walk. We'll show an example next week in church. But... Um, they were out in a prayer walk, and they start to, you know, as you pray for your neighbors, you pray for your family, you, God sometimes just cues you to a person or a face comes to mind and, or a home that, you know, you're not sure what's going on, but you spend a little bit more time praying for that home because whatever's going on there, Lord, there's something happening. And, 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 and as these guys were praying, they thought of their friend Aaron. They're like, where has Aaron been? We have not seen Aaron for a while. And so they remembered where his dorm room was, and so they went up to his dorm, and they just started praying over his door. And after a while, both of them just got the urge to knock. So they started knocking, and no one came. They thought, oh, maybe he just went home and quit college, or maybe uh, he's sleeping over at his back of his family's place. Or, but they just kept knocking five minutes, six minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes. Their knuckles are getting sore. They switch hands, 11, 12 minutes, 14 minutes. Finally, 15 minutes, the light turns on just kind of just flows out the bottom of the doorway and they hear this weak, feeble voice, who's there? And they tell him who they are, he recognizes their voices, he opens the door and they don't even recognize this skeleton of a face inside that dark room. Just dark and it just felt like, you know, even though he turned the light on, it was, it was just pitch black in that room. And they walked in, and he kind of felt like he had no choice because they, they knew something was wrong. And he just, for the first time in his life, growing up in an abusive family with a neglective father and an addicted mother, for the first time in his life, Aaron told somebody the truth. 
He didn't cover it. He didn't hide it. He didn't gloss it over. It just, it just came out, and he wept, and he shuddered, and he cried. And then these two friends did what he ex- didn't do, what he expected everyone to do if he would let them in. They didn't reject him. They didn't you know, make fun of him. They didn't ridicule him. They put their hands on his shoulders, and they said, let us pray for you. And they prayed, and as they prayed, he, he, say, he later said that he felt like he just started getting lifted up. Like, that was my low point moment. And then when they started praying for me, I felt like my life started to get manageable and light started coming back in. And I, my, my life, st- I started to see again. He described that moment when people were willing to shine a light into his life as the very moment where his life began to change. And he began to get healed. And now he's in ministry doing the same for other people. When you let people speak into your life or when you're healed and you take the time to shine a light into other people's life, that's the kind of thing that happens. And so again, I ask you in your bulletin, will you give at least one person, one Christ follower, permission to speak straight into your darkness, not just the things you're comfortable sharing. Christians can get together and talk about Jesus and go home and I'm talking about the other stuff. Will you do that? Because light doesn't hide. Uh, as we sing this last song, I invite you to stand up and just kind of declare light into your life. Go to the map, find where you live, put a tack there, make sure you grab the slip on your chair and take steps this week to live that out and ask God to shine into you so you can shine into others. Will you stand and will you pray? Heavenly Father, we don't want to be a community of people that say one thing on Sundays and do something else when we leave here, live something, some other message, some other gospel, some other choice pattern that really defines darkness, not light. Make us vulnerable enough to sit down over a cup of coffee or a a phone call and ask the hard questions. Invite people to point to the hard issues so that we can get healthy, we can get help, we can get light, and so we can share it. Make us people of light who have experienced your kingdom so fully, your healing and restoring power that we can actually let it shine through us, God. Don't let us hide in Jesus' name.